You're listening to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and it's time for this week's Long Island News, the show that talks to newsmakers from Nassau and Suffolk County that matter to Long Island and Long Islanders like you. So each week, we'll have a conversation about issues that affect all of us. I live on Long Island just like you, and I do want to know more about where my tax dollars are going, and I want to know more about the people making the big decisions that affect all of us. And well, Election Day has come and gone, and the results are mostly in. Uh, Let's figure out who the winners and the losers were and what the results mean for all of us by welcoming back to the show Yancey Roy, Newsday's Albany Bureau Chief. Well, good morning and welcome back. Thanks. Good to be here, Bill. (laughs) You were in the middle of the battle, so (laughs) (laughs) Um, I guess we were, I guess we were happily uh, what the reality would be during the campaign when you hear a lot of noise from everybody. And, you know, when it settled down, I think uh, quite a few of us were surprised that the result was what it was. Well, it was an interesting, you know, look, it, there's so many interesting races, there's so many offices that were up for grabs this year, right? I mean, you had uh, the, the marquee race, of course, is governor. You also had U.S. Senator, race for U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer running for reelection, uh, attorney general, comptroller. You had the entire congressional delegation of New York State with new maps ordered this year by a court. You had the entire state legislature, 213 seats. And so there was, you know, all multiple levels of competition and issues and factors here and how things played up and down the ballot. Um, You know, certainly the marquee race was governor, right? It's Kathy Hochul, the Democrat who became governor when Andrew Cuomo resigned a year ago, was in office one year, now running for her first four-year term against uh, Republican Congressman Lee Zeldin from Shirley. Um, And it it was an interesting race. Uh, You know, Hochul and the Democrats started out with all the advantages. The Democrats have a more than two to one enrollment advantage in New York State. Um, She had raised a lot of money, a lot of money, Uh, ended up being somewhere around $50 million. You know, she had... uh, Cruise through the primary and as of Labor Day had a 17 point lead in the polls, at least one poll. Uh, but sort of in hindsight and what a lot of Democrats said is that her campaign kind of took its foot off the gas sometime in September. And meanwhile, Lee Zeldin was very energetic all over the state uh, talking about inflation, but mostly talking about crime uh, and levels of crime, rates of crime, perception of crime and really trying to hammer Hochul on this message and especially uh, some of the legislation that had been passed recently by uh, a Democrat controlled Albany. And you saw him whittle into that lead and cut it down and cut it down until it got down to single digits. And I think what you saw in the final two weeks is Democrats uh, realizing their candidate was, was, you know, a little in trouble or a closer race than they ever thought it would be um, kind of really revving up. You saw some big names come in. Uh, President Joe Biden among them. And um, you also saw a lot of their supporters, especially unions, really kick into gear uh, to help Hochul. And, you know, two weeks ago or or about a week and a half ago, I think Republicans were very optimistic that Lee Zeldin could pull off an upset and become the first Republican to win in 20 years. But um, through a combination of things, that last little surge by Hochul, uh, what we ended up with is uh, about a six point win, five and a half point win, um, you know, 53, 47 or right. 52 and a half to 47 and a half, however you want to slice it. Um, and she won. But elsewhere, the Republicans did make uh, a lot of gains. They picked up uh, they have three more congressional districts than they did when we started out with this. Um, they made a few gains in the state assembly. Uh, on Long Island and also in the state Senate on Long Island. So they didn't win the marquee race, but elsewhere down the ballot, the Republicans did uh, did well in New York. Yeah, yeah. I think, uh, you know, you, you categorize it, because uh, you're right, there was a point there where we saw uh, Zeldin climbing up and climbing up, and it didn't look as though there was uh, a Democratic reaction. Um, you know, and it's funny to say because uh, from perception, I was under the impression that a lot of the unions had backed Zeldin um, because he he made those things public. Hochul didn't. Well, he he certainly touted a lot of law enforcement unions, various 
uh, PBA's Police, Police Benevolent Association, which is the name for a lot of the different chapters of law enforcement. And yes, he touted those a lot. And he had press conferences with a lot of those. Um, but what Hochul had was a lot of the big member, deep pocketed unions in New York State. And we're talking about the AFL CIO. Mm-hmm. We're talking about New York State United Teachers, a teachers union. Um, we're talking about uh, 1199 SEIU, which is the very influential healthcare workers union. They also had uh, hotel trades and, and uh, 32BJ, which is maintenance and other workers. So these are all unions that A, have a lot of members, mm. B, typically have a lot of money to spend on elections, and C, can do a lot of the things like go to that, that say a county committee can't do or a state committee can do, but they can help out, which is uh, knock on doors, send text, make phone calls. Um, you know, one of the things that the AFL CIO coordinated for Hochul was what they called labor walks. It was every Saturday and Sunday for the last seven weeks of the campaign where you had uh, AFL CIO members, you need to have a list of other union members and you would go in the, those towns or whatever um, and go door to door and knock and say, you know, here's who we're backing. Would you consider backing? And that's, you know, something that probably goes under the radar of like, mm. uh, you know, TV coverage or anything like that. But those are important things in, in election, especially in getting people out to vote, because all along there had been this talk and polls had backed it up that, there was a, an enthusiasm gap, right? That Republican voters were really motivated generally and committed and Democrats not quite to the same level. Um, at least that's what you saw, say, in early to mid-October. So the way the unions play a role there is in ginning up other, um, you know, excitement and enthusiasm for people to actually go out to the poll. Yeah, yeah. Well, when I saw the number, um, you had a, a, a nice article in yesterday's Newsday explaining some of this. And to think that, you know, uh, pulling a rabbit out of a hat the last minute, getting someone to make 70,000 phone calls for you. <laughs> well, some of this had been planned for a long time, right? Yeah, I mean, okay. some of the, you, you have to plan this. You can't just like say, hey, we're, hey tomorrow we're starting. Right, right. Um, okay. So some of this had been planned for a while. I think, though, that generally you can say that uh, – Given where the polls were in the last two weeks, that it was just, you know, scaled up even more. You know, you can't some of these things you can't plan just a day or two ahead of time. Yeah, you got to no. plan a month ahead of time. But you can have more people working at a phone bank and work that you first start and you can work longer on Election Day than you first start. Uh, yeah. I thought I thought about. Yeah, I got quite a few phone calls sitting uh, home <laughs> and and. Uh, one of them what is it uh, early voting. Uh, that's that's the name yep. that came up when. Um, and I, I will probably get them for another week because I don't know how long it takes them <laughs> to tamp down this machine they started rolling. You know, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious though. Uh, one of the things that, and, and I, I interviewed a guy uh, a little while ago, and we talked a lot about gerrymandering. Um, how, mm. how did that really play into, uh, into this election? Well, in, in the broad sense, uh, Republicans. Uh, did better, but let's back up and, and tell folks what that is. Is every ten years you have to redraw your congressional districts. Every state does. You redraw your state legislative districts. This is typically done by your legislature. And what happened earlier this year is the Democrat-controlled Assembly and Senate in in Albany passed new maps for all of that. Uh, Republicans sued. And to, to make it short here, they claim two things that uh, the congressional districts were gerrymandered, meaning uh, drawn in a way that favored a lot of Democrats and not so many Republicans. And then the, the legislature also failed to follow uh, the legal the exact steps in the legal process for adopting these maps. Mm. And in the end, the court system agreed with the Republicans, ordered uh, all new districts drawn for well gave handed over to a special master a court appointed master to draw new districts for right. congress and senate and uh, a neutral master drew uh, districts that were well let's put it this way didn't certainly didn't favor democrats like the democrat drawn map did it yeah. made a lot more seats very much more competitive and um mm. so what you had is in new york uh, in the end, what it looks like, 
uh, is that well, we also lost a seat. So we had 27 seats. We're going to only have 26 now. But going into the election, it was 19 Democrats and eight Republicans. And now it's going to be 15 Democrats and 11 Republicans. And uh, two of those seats that they picked up were on Long Island. Um, the island has four congressional districts totally within the island. Going into this election, it was two and two Democrats and Republicans. And now it's all four Republicans. And that hasn't happened um, since, I think, 1994, that the entire delegation from the island has been all Republican. Wow. Interesting. And and you look at that, and that's especially where I think uh, national headwinds played uh, a real role. Um, Control of Congress is up, you know, popularity of Biden, not great. uh, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden, not great on Long Island. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Republicans were able to take two seats that the Democrats long held uh, in Nassau County. Um, And, you know, and did better there in some ways than than they did in other states. And at least in terms of beating the expectations game. I I think that a lot of us on Long Island were a little surprised by uh, the demographics and, and, you know, who was supporting what. I mean, I look nationally, it it looks like uh, certainly Donald Trump didn't do so well with uh, the the people he backed. There's a lot of talk about that now, right? I mean, especially looking at Pennsylvania, the Senate race there, which went to to Democrat. Uh, And, and, you know, there's there's certainly going to be some fallout on the national scene for Republicans. It'll be interesting to see how that that plays out. Someone like a Ron DeSantis. Santos or moves more, the Florida governor moves more into the center stage for them. Okay, I have a, well, here's what I have. What, um, so we talked about the big races, so the latest voters. Um, the election was close. So this is uh, this is my producer asking questions. So let's see what he's got here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the election was close. What do Democrats need to do to keep control four years from now? Well, you know, uh, sometimes it's always hard to predict exactly where the electorate's going to be and where the national politics are going to be in four years. I mean, just for an example, look how much they changed from 2014 to 2018, which uh, by 18, Donald Trump was president. And that was a, a big factor in the elections. By 2020, you had a number of other things, not only the impeachment of Trump, but COVID. And you know, so sometimes you can't forecast everything that's going to come up. But that said, look, um, the Democrats, won all four statewide offices that were up for grabs in New York. Though they lost some seats in the legislature, they still have an overwhelming majority, uh, about two-thirds in the the assembly. It looks like not quite two-thirds in the state Senate. Some races are not finalized yet, but it looks like they're going to get, the Democrats will have not quite two-thirds, but meaning they lost a net of one or two seats. It's it, it certainly Zeldin made an issue and all Republicans up and down the ticket made an issue of crime. And and yeah. so there'll be pressure on Kathy Hochul and the Democrats on that issue. And, and again, it, it sometimes it sometimes these things follow what's going on, uh, you know, out in the public. If, if crime goes up more, it'll be more pressure. If crime goes down. Maybe there might not be enough, enough pressure. One thing that's, um, you know, look, here's one thing to think about now. Hochul. You know, her first year, it was, you know, kind of thrust into this after Cuomo resigned. You were simultaneously trying to do your first budget and run for election because it was an election year. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, the the sort of M.O., if you will, with the legislature was have a nice, easy session, probably spend a lot of money, Mm -hmm. (laughs) which they did uh, keep everyone fairly happy, not have too many fights. Well, you know, typically uh, when a governor comes in first year in office, and this is true whether it was Andrew Cuomo or Elliot Spitzer or George Pataki, your first year coming off an election victory is often the year that you have your fights with the legislature. If you're going to have them, have them the first year, uh, not in an election year. So I, I, I don't know if there's anything that we can point to right now immediately where they could fight. If you're looking for something, it could be the first year. Also this first year, you know, there's uh, no more of that real generous federal pandemic aid for New York. And right. it was, uh, there was a lot of money the last two years and you were able to make huge increases in school spending, especially. And, and that's part of why the teachers union back Hochul, mm-hmm. um, you know, a lot of that aid dries up and, and the con- the economy, as we all know, is up and down, up and down. So making a budget might be a lot tougher this mm-hmm. year going forward. And another thing to keep an eye on also, uh, Bill is, uh, Hochul has to appoint a new chief judge in New York. 
Janet DeFiori uh, had retired earlier this year. She was a Cuomo appointee. She certainly steered the court in sort of a conservative judicial direction, certainly on criminal justice matters. And Hochul will be under a lot of pressure, especially from uh, progressives, liberal uh, legislators, to appoint a more liberal chief judge this time around. That won't happen until December. But you can ensure that the the wheels are already grinding as to, you know, getting that done. So that's something that folks should really, you know, keep an eye on as we get ready to move into the new year. Yeah, really. Well, I'd like to remind our audience that they're listening to this week's Long Island News on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and my guest today is Yancey Roy, Newsday's Albany Bureau Chief. And we're breaking down basically the results of Tuesday's big elections here in Nassau County. Um, what else did they have on my, on my, well, list? you know, there was a, you know, there's an interesting on the Island with the, some of the legislative districts where, uh, Republicans made gains, especially you look at the state Senate. Um, they upset, uh, Anna Kaplan, a democratic Senator from North Hills. Uh, she was defeated by Jack Martins, uh, former Senator himself, former mayor of Mineola. They picked up that seat there. They also defeated a Democrat, John Brooks. Mm. Um, in short order, and just to, from four years ago, think about this. The Long Island Senate delegation was six Democrats and three Republicans. And going into January, it'll just be two Democrats and seven Republicans. So that's really flipped back around. Um, and it also looks like the Republicans have picked up two assembly seats, uh, Brian Curran in sort of the Lindbrook Rockville Center area he was a former legislator. He lost an 18 uh, Republican. He lost his seat in 18 in the blue wave. He comes back and he looks like he's won, although I don't know if it's final as we speak right now, but it looks like he's won and come back uh, there. So, and, and also to note, uh, and sort of a surprise, maybe a surprise upset because it was under the radar, Steve Engelbright, uh, an assemblyman from Suffolk County, since 1992, he's 30 years in office. It looks as though he has lost his reelection bid. Mm. Wow. Okay, I have the. Uh, let's see, I have the list here. Um. All right, District Two, Republican Andrew Garbarino, won over Democrat Jackie Gordon. District Three, Republican George Santos beat Democrat Robert Zimmerman. District 4, Republican Anthony D'Esposito beat Democrat Laura Gillen. Uh, the State Senate District, Republican Stephen Rhodes beat Democrat John Brooks. State Senate District 6, oh, a Democrat won that one, Kevin Thomas over James Call. Uh, Senate, State Senate District 7, Republican Jack Martins, as you just mentioned, uh, beat Democrat Anna Kaplan. State Senate District 8, Republican Alexis Weick beat Democrat John Alberts, and State Senate District 9, Republican Patricia Canzoneri Fitzpatrick beat Democrat Kenneth Moore. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, it's going to be a relatively new crop of representatives from Long Island when it comes to the Senate. All of the folks who had been there for a while uh, either retired or uh, defeated. I mean, Kevin Thomas will be the most senior Democrat and mm. he will be only, he's only done four years. So he'll be starting his fifth year. Um, all, mm. Almost all the Republicans are, are, uh, are, are fairly new uh, within the last few years as well. So there's going to be a lot of new faces in mm. that Long Island delegation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I guess as a, uh, as an observer, so what do I do? Do I, do I watch? <laughs> yeah. You know, do I, do I watch the voting records? Is that, you know, to see if the partisanship that we've been experiencing is, is going to be here too, uh, you know? Well, yeah, well, look, the, um, when it comes to the state legislature, it's still solidly democratic. Right. And, um, so, uh, so on the one hand, uh, Democrats will control the overall houses on the other hand. And, and there won't be many Democrats from Long Island in, in Albany. That said, mm. um, it, it can sometimes work to your advantage because if you're one of a few Democrats representing the Island in Albany, um, you know, maybe, maybe you're protected a little bit more. Maybe you get a little bit more for your districts or your schools or something that, 
you know, bills that you're trying to pass. Um, you know, at the same time, Republicans will have much more pressure to put on Democrats and, and really put a microscope on uh, the, the Long Island Democrats who are in the legislature. And, and, you know, when the session's going on and when it's over to kind of ask the question of how did the island do? How did your school do uh, this year with with Democrats still uh, in control of the legislature? Mm. Right. Yeah, that's. Uh... Another thing to kind of keep an eye on, I mean, this is kind of it's not quite as tangible or pocketbook for folks, but, you know, Long Island Power Authority, right? It's uh, always mm-hmm. been a little bit embattled and, and controversial, when, especially when there's problems, right? And so a law passed earlier this year created a commission that's supposed to figure out the future of LIPA. And it's supposed to decide if it's supposed to become a public utility or not. Mm. Now, uh, all of but certain this is because of the elections and the campaigns. Not much has happened with that commission so far. They were supposed to have public hearings. Not really had that. Um, they're supposed to come up with a plan and a recommendation by the end of the year. We'll see if that still happens or if that gets pushed off. And they'll make a recommendation at some point, and then it'll be at some point it'll be in the hands of uh, lawmakers what to do with LIPA. And, um, you know, like I say, that's always, sometimes it's a punching bag for folks. Mm. Uh, sometimes it's uh, controversial LIPA. Uh, Democrats have set in motion this idea that maybe it'd be better to be a public utility again. And, you know, that's, that's something that, you know, for long range, certainly as the year goes on in 2023 to see how that plays out, it's be very important for uh, Long Islanders. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things, I mean, LIPA is kind of like the middleman, no? In, in, yes, uh, yes. Um, it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't actually do the day-to-day running of the grid, if you will. PSEG is the uh, contracted company that does the running of it, but it's the responsibility is LIPA. And so uh, a public, making it a public utility would make it, it would likely make it more directly LIPA's uh, responsibility, but mm-hmm. lots of, lots of, lots of issues to be sorted out. There. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I think of the same thing with, uh, um, you know, when you sit around and talking with people who live in Nassau County, uh, you know, we, we still have NIFA. So, uh, the finance authority. Yeah. 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 So, uh, I mean, and not that I know the machinations of exactly how they work with each other, but you know, to simplify it, I I think of this, um, I don't know. My friends used to use the term high priced beef, you know, sitting around, sitting around a table, deciding things, um, and okay, well, we've come to a conclusion. And then NIFA comes and looks over their shoulder and says, no, you can't do that. And you can't do this. And you can't do the other thing. Um, well, I mean, to, to just kind of, make it real simple. I mean, the, the Nassau interim finance authority in IFA yeah. was created long time ago when more or less the county's finances were a big, big mess. Right. And, and so this authority has like oversight to sign off on certain um, spending decisions by NIFA. And so there's, I mean, by the county. Okay. So there's always this, this tension there um, where the county leaders, Republican or a Democrat have sometimes complained about NIFA and, and, and not uh, allowing them to go forward with plans. Mm. NIFA typically says, yeah, we're not letting you go forward with plans because it's not financially sound or we think there's some fiscal problems. Anyway, that's a real simplification of it, yeah. but, but it's still there. And, and the idea is that it was put there because the county finances had gotten so out of whack a long time ago. Right. Right. Well, I, I mean, I've lived on Long Island my whole life, so uh, to me, it, it was uh, politically, it's kind of like, um, I would say, tradition. Uh, you know, th- things are running along, and people become unhappy with who's ever in charge for a certain period of time at the moment, and so one of the the ideas is, well, let's just give it to the other guy. Uh, you know, we'll spread it around. You know, I mean, they they screwed it up, so maybe these guys will screw it up differently, or they'll do something else. Um, but for, for me to look at that, traditionally, uh, it, it was Republican administrations that ran things into the ground. And then uh, when they handed it back over to the Democrats, they were the ones that started fixing the finances. And 
Now that could be uh, uh, maybe a very incorrect, you know, but, but over the years, that's what I've gleaned from, you know, that's the kind of feeling I get. Um, well, it was put, NIFA was put in when it was, uh, when Nassau County was led by Republicans. There was certainly a, a switch over and now this century Democrats have held it, whether it's under Swazi or, or, or Curran. And now we're back to Republicans under Bruce Blakeman. Um, you know, it's, uh, and look for counties kind of everywhere, are always in a tough position financially. Uh, upstate and downstate, they have a lot of responsibilities um, to cover. You know, a lot of counties have nursing homes and other sort of very expensive things that they got to cover the cost of personnel. And they don't have, you know, they don't have the uh, quite as a free reign as, say, the state to bring in revenue, whether that's through taxes or whatever. So, you know, yeah. the somewhat sympathetic view is counties everywhere sometimes uh are, are hurting and either complaining about the state or a state oversight board. Right. Um, it's been a long running story in New York. Yeah, right. I, you brought up a really good point because it's something that was always in the back of my mind when we talked finances in the last couple of years is that there, there was a lot of COVID money and it almost seemed like mm-hmm. it was laying around, you know, so somebody could come out and say, uh, you know, Hey, we're going to, we're going to build a new this or we're going to, okay. You, you know, uh, when that cash disappears, I think is when we'll probably start to really see some more tension. People realizing that, no, you spent it. It's gone. Well, yeah. And that's, uh, that's going to be one of the big questions for Kathy Hochul's uh, first year as a newly elected governor. Um, You know, the last year uh, they were, like I say, they were able, we talked about this earlier. They were able to give very generous increases to schools. I want to say 7%, which is, Right. I mean, probably at least double of the, the usual normal bump for schools. Um, they were able to do a lot of health care grants. They were able to do a lot of uh, salary bonuses and signing bonuses for health care workers. You know, a lot of that's drying, drying or dried up now. And so it's going to be interesting to see just how much money will be available come January and 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 where the fights will be with the governor and the legislature. Oh, well, Yancey, I'm going to remind the audience again that uh, they're listening to this week's Long Island News on 90.3 WHBC, the voice of Nassau Community College. Um, Yancey Roy, who is the Newsday Albany Bureau Chief, has been with us discussing uh, what went on in the election. And uh, it's always a pro- pleasure to talk to you, Yancey. You, uh, you, you make sense to me. I thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and, Always uh, a pleasure. By the way, great article yesterday. That was uh, that was really good because uh, I think oh, thank you. I think there was a big question on everybody's mind. Is just you know, it's it's like seeing a car accident and you say, wait, what just happened? You know, uh, I I think the expectation was different than the result. Um, Republicans spent a lot of money on Zeldin signs, uh, but apparently there were not people behind those to actually do the voting. Yeah. Well, uh, look, Zeldin came as close as a Republican has in, in decades, right? Um, he's, 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 you know, we've had just a series of blowouts in New York gubernatorial elections. Um, you know, my colleague Mike Gormley uh, did a really extensive article on, on what Zeldin's path to victory was, how much percent he had to get on Long Island, how much in the city, how much upstate. And and the path for a Republican, because you're so outnumbered in New York, is very narrow. And you have to hit these certain percentages. And <clears throat> and even though he did well and he got more than 47 percent of the vote to get over 50, well, Lee Zeldin fell just a little bit short of what he needed in New York City. He fell a little bit short of what he needed in the metro suburbs. And actually, he fell a little bit short of what he needed in upstate. He, he won upstate, but Hochul was able to win the metro areas, you know, the Albany, the Syracuse, yeah. Rochester, the Buffalo, you put all of those together and it, it's just not quite enough for Zeldin to win the, the race. Thank you again. And uh, the clock on the wall is screaming at me that we've got to get out of here. And my guest today has been Yancey Roy, Newsday's Albany Bureau Chief. And Yancey, again, thank you for taking time out of your day to talk to us. Um, and we do hope you'll come back in the new year once the, the action continues, you can help us figure out what the heck is going on. Okay. Sure thing. I, yep. Thank you very much. We'll take care. We'll thank see you guys. You, we'll see you soon. Okay. All righty. Take care. Bye-bye. And just a reminder, you can follow Yance's reporting on Newsday and on Newsday.com.
And so the clock on the wall says it's time for this week's Long Island News to move on out of here. I'm Bill McIntyre, and remember, you can listen to us uh, every Friday at 3 p.m. right here on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.